Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin now with our first conversation of the day. It's a real pleasure to introduce to the stage the facilitator for the, for the conversations today. Um, she's a person that doesn't need any introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Penelope Curtebone. Thanks. Oh. It's wonderful to be here. That's my joke. I use that all the time. Oh. Thank you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> so I don't have hula hoops, but I can juggle. But I won't do that to you. I won't bore you with that. Uh, look, it's great to be here, and it's wonderful to see you all here. And I, I was just saying to Joe um, before, this is such a fantastic room. What a warm and beautiful space you have here. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm very thrilled to be hosting two sessions this morning. But um, most importantly, the first gentleman here who is going to be talking to us is flying solo. Uh, his name is Professor John Coveney. He is uh, the Dean of the School of Health Sciences. Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University. Could you have a longer title? Well, we can make that up. We yeah, can make that up. Yeah, let's yeah. keep going. Uh, would you please welcome Professor John Coveney. How are you? Um, I'm really well. How are you? Fine. Good. I know it's John because it says it here. Okay. If you want to read the rest of his bio, it's, uh, it's there. Now, one of the things that's interesting about John, we're going to be talking... I think sweet. we have to do this. Is that okay? Um, one of the great things about John is that not only is he the dean uh, and a smart dude, but also he loves arts. Okay, and he's a choral singer. So we've already organised a duet to start with. You start. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you be, be careful here, Fenella, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I'm a, I'm a doo wop singer. Are you? So I'll, really? I'll strike in with doo wop, doo wop. Do a ba do a do ba do a ba do a do a ba and then you right. sing blue moon. Blue moon. You saw me standing. Right. Anyway. Okay, we'll do this at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. This is good. Okay, so today we're talking about that about connections. As you know, it's about the the the, the junk, you know, the nexus between art and, and health. And and who better to to have a conversation with about this? So John, let's let's get into some background. What do you do? I know, yeah, get your hands up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do as dean? What does okay. a dean do? So a dean leads, um, in this case a school, in this case a school of health sciences, um, in ways which can help promote the health and well-being of the people who pay our wages, the general, you know, the general community. We've got a very interesting school, a terrific school. Um, we have a range of allied health programs in the school, the therapies, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, nutrition and dietetics. We've, you know, we've got that, that's great. But added to that, and that's what makes the school really interesting, we've got palliative care, you know, end of life stuff. We've got disability studies, we've got public health. I'm sure there's a group that I've forgotten, but it's a very, very eclectic school which makes for a wonderful, wonderful mix of themes, um, trends, and, and, and one of my jobs is to try to bring people out of their silos mm. and bring them into a more shared space, which is very challenging, but you know, that's an ongoing, an ongoing task for me. So that's what, that's what a dean does. I think uh, a dean fires imagination, it provides leadership, they, pro it, they provide leadership, uh, encouragement, um, sometimes carrots, sometimes sticks. Yeah, yeah that's and, what your, and your personal area, of course, is in uh, as a nutritionist. Ma yeah, I'm, and di uh, yeah, that's right. I trained, I trained as a dietitian. I've worked yep. as a nutritionist in, in the UK and Papua New Guinea, here in various states. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was a dietitian, who um, told people what they should eat, which basically was what they shouldn't eat. You know, right. and try to eat, eat fewer chocolates and more right. carrot sticks. You know. <laughs> what should we be eating today at lunch? I'm oh. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, the, the hat nearly went on, you know, well. the hat nearly went on. So, so, yeah. But fortunately, carrot sticks were all, all day. That's it, <laughs> nothing else. Um, and of course, the arts, we've already discussed, we've had a little bit of a sing-along already, yeah, which is great. Terrific. We might even wrap that up with, with more we'll of that. I, I want you guys to do up, okay? Yeah, yeah. Good, I love this. This is fun. Um, the arts, of course, being very important to you personally. So tell me what role then arts plays in your Look, life. It, it, that's, <laughs> when I saw the program and it said John is an art lover, okay. I, I, I wasn't sure that I was an art lover. I mean, I love, <laughs> I love singing. Because I've always imagined art to be higher, you know. You go to galleries and, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I really have very little appreciation of that. Although 
recently, for another reason, I had to go and look again at the Velasquez, La, Las Meninos. Has anybody ever seen Las Meninos, that Velasquez painting in the Prado? Mm. It's very, very interesting. It's a painting of a painter who's coming away from their easel, looking to, at you, um, and it's obviously the painter looking at himself, but actually in the mirror you can see that it's Isabel and Fer, Fer, Ferdinand, I think. Is that right? You know, the King of the Queen. So it's a very, it, and, and, the, and the children are looking at the, uh, at the, at the painter. Mm. So it's a very challenging piece of work. And that's the kind of art I really like, things that kind of take you beyond, oh, what is this trying to do? Trying to show you the dimensions of human, you know, mm. human But the thing is, it's already, it's embedded in your life regardless because you are a singer, so you, you, you well, may yeah. not think of yourself as yeah, being yeah. It's true. It's as true. high yeah. as you know, the Velasquez that you talk about, but yeah. it's part of who you are. And we so forget that, don't we? We do, we do. And I mean, had somebody said to me, well, your singing is actually art. I thought, oh, okay, yeah. When I think about it, it is. Um, but I hadn't, you know, really gone to singing because it was a form of art. I went to singing because... I, you know, I sing with an a cappella group, sing with two a cappella groups, and I love harmony, and, and that's what took me there. So, I, you know, I think it's an but interesting part of the conversation we, 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 we might have, and that is, you know, we, we're quite happy to talk about things being healthiest, and that is that we, we view the world, people from health, um, as health endeavours. Um, you know, everything has to be around health. It's probably a conversation that needs to be had as to whether people are artists, Mm. And like every part of human creative process is, well, actually, that's art. Mm. You know, we'll claim that as art. I don't have a problem with it. Or creativity. Probably, something like that. Or yeah. innovation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you yeah. don't have a problem with either of those things? To view um, I'm through either of those pr I'm prisons? <laughs> I don't have a problem with healthism, naturally. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, that pays my wages. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but does it pay? But art is artism, you know. So, so for example, um, I <clears throat> present and produce a radio program um, for Radio Adelaide. It's called Gastronaut. Goes at toast to air twelve thirty on Saturday. Gastronaut. Okay, one hundred one point five FM on your band. Yeah, Gastronaut. Okay, right. so it's a program about about food in its many many sort of manifestations. You know, it's gastronomy. Yeah. It's um, food policy, whatever. So we put this together, um, me and a crew, and we put it to air, and afterwards it really feels great, you know, when you walk out of the studio. Is that art? Yeah. Is that a form of art? Yes. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Because you're making something. You're yeah. creating something. Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a process right. of doing, okay, which, which you are giving people information, yeah. but at the same time you're getting yeah. great benefit out of it. Yeah. So you can call that healthy art radio. Okay. How's that yeah. sound? So, well, there you go. But we, I mean, ah, the, 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 the other members of Gastronaut would, would rail against that. They say we're not health because what we do right. is we explore pleasure, we explore a whole range of things that we would not necessarily call health. So, uh, you know, I have to be careful with my, my people that we, we don't turn Gastronaut <laughs> into something which is just about giving healthy messages by yeah, yeah. eating you know, two fruit and five veg a day. Yeah, yeah, there you no. go, that's the message, two fruit and five veg. <laughs> <laughs> um, except for durian fruit, keep them off the buses, I say. Uh, yeah. Well, I think there's a, there's a smell-free version <laughs> yeah, yeah. now, isn't there? But, but what, how can you taste that? I mean, uh, the whole taste is in the stink, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we eat blue cheese, so that's fair enough. Um, which, which leads me to an interesting point. I think we should delineate. I think we should do some definitions from your point of view. And, and I think this morning there'll be lots of conversations about this. But in, in your view, where do you personally sit um, on the art and health sector? How do you define what it is? Oh, I don't know whether I can. And I don't know whether I want to. Um, can we come back to that at the end? Yeah? Okay. Because through this conversation, I might, yeah. I might have arrived at a definition of where I sit on this. So, there, the, the, okay, so let's talk about the, the spectrum, right. uh, which has been done very nicely, I might say, in the National Guidelines for Arts and Health. I think Christine Putland, who's here today, had a, a strong hand in that. So, you know, the spectrum I've got in mind is one where, at one end, there's a kind of community space in which art sits. And, and then coming through, there's arts as therapy. Mm. And there's arts that play a role in helping people who already have um, chronic conditions. So there's arts for people who have, you know, well-being to help enhance their well-being. There might be arts for people who are at risk um, of whatever. Yeah. Then there's arts for people as, as therapy to people who already have a health problem and are recovering. 
and rehabilitating from that. And then there's arts for that. So if you think about that, I suppose my school would sit most comfortably in that area as arts as therapy. So in my school we have uh, programs that have subjects that look at um, leisure, arts and rehabilitation. That's actually quite, quite a big course, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. We have um, in our occupational therapy program, there's a lot of emphasis on art, art production, art as emotion, art as play. Um, and, and, and the important thing to remember about those is that they always have a pointy end. They're about, OK, there's a health outcome here. So for, for occupational therapists, you know, it's about fine motor skills or gross motor skills. You know, it's about people developing that. So arts as therapy is really about arts in the purpose of helping people recover, rehabilitate. You know? um, we also have some really interesting research in the school which is looking at new technology and, and art. And this is in the area of physiotherapy and really building on some fairly recent discoveries that you can recruit you know, neuronal pathways that you thought weren't there for people who have had uh, some kind of stroke or some kind of compromise, that you can recruit those by getting people into an art space, into a virtual reality, getting them moving, getting them mobile. We've actually got a researcher who's an international expert in that area. And in fact, um, one of the things I do as Dean is um, we, we podcast an interview that I have with uh, a staff member, and our most recent interview is with uh, Belinda Lang. And I can, I can give you the link to that, and you can hear her talking about her research in this area, which is, which is just terrific. Yeah. I mean, it's really cutting-edge stuff. And so the, the new technologies that you're talking about, which may include augmented reality, AR, yeah. or virtual yeah. reality, VR, yeah. or you know, AI, even artificial intelligence, these for you, are, I mean, other than the more traditional arts that exist, these are the new, the new more exciting, the very exciting moments, the big movement that is happening at the present. Well, I, comes I, to, uh, the, I, the, it's the, certainly cutting-edge stuff. And I, yeah. I, I think when I think about arts and therapy, this is probably an area that's going to become more and more fertile as uh, more and more opportunities open up to work in, 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 in this space. Mm. I must stop saying this space. You Everybody can say says this, space. this space. Well, I like this space right now. This space. Yeah. <laughs> the benefits, though, I mean, I think we'll get to, because you, you mentioned the words the pointy end, which I, quite, I find yeah. quite interesting, but I'll yeah. get that to that in a second. But I mean, even big, sort of broadly, the benefits of medical professionals working with artists or working more closely with artists or designers or those in the new technology fields that you've just highlighted as well. Broadly, why, is, why do you think that is very important or key? Well, I think because it opens up new opportunities that we didn't think were there. I mean, there was a time when we thought that people who had a stroke, they'd lost that capacity and that side of the brain or whatever, and that was it. You know, you just weren't able to uh, function. And I think all well, that's being challenged now. And um, some of this new technology and getting people to play and to be creative in an art space, whether it's a virtual environment or whatever environment, is, is, actually, challenging, is actually challenging that in, in rehabilitation. So I think that the, the opportunities for new ideas, and you people know the ideas, bring them to us, mm. um, are, really, are really fantastic. Mm. Uh, are medical professionals in your expertise or in your experience uh, welcome, open arm to this, or being dragged kicking and screaming? Because I, 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 I suppose part of it is there's this, this sort of over-medicalisation of human life yeah. in so many aspects. Yeah. And so where arts can come in, in the health, the benefits are, may not be very easy to yeah. quantify sometimes, but obviously that, the benefits are there. Look, uh, well, you know, so I don't really have the medical constituents in my school, but I'm happy to speak for them and about them, naturally. Yep. <laughs> um, we have some people from the School of Medicine here today. Oh, really? Actually, who's here from so the medicine, School of Medicine? Hands up. John Oliver down there, who's a fantastic artist. Hi there. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Horrified. And a, Don't look and, at me. And a fantastic <laughs> scientist. Let me tell you, this person taught me everything about science. Fabulous. Really great. I mean that. That's good, because I mean my high school science teacher so, did not. So I wouldn't, so. Say, I, would, I wouldn't say for medicine, I wouldn't say the door was closed when it came to arts. But I don't sh I'm not sure whether the, the welcome mat is, is out. Mm. I think that probably there needs to be a lot more push, a lot more shove um, from both ends. Mm. So if I was dean of the School of Medicine, <laughs> <laughs> 
I think I might be pushing that, actually. Yeah. Well, we've had some really, because <laughs> uh, I'm pushing it in my school, in, right. in certain ways, yeah. So, so the barriers that exist come from both sides, but yeah. from, from the I medical mean, fraternity's yeah. point of view, what are those barriers? Well, I imagine version? there are things about where is the evidence, yep. you know, show me the evidence. But anyway, that, that, that's not made a great deal of difference in, in many, many practices, even when you show practitioners the evidence. They say, oh, that's very interesting. They carry on doing what they did yesterday. You know, so you probably need a few more carrots and sticks to make that happen. Back Money to carrots talks. again. Money <laughs> talks. So if you can, you know, yeah. if you can provide some funding or something like that to embed arts in medicine, arts in health sciences, and you know, that's where we can work together. There mm. are some opportunities to actually get that funding. Mm. Industry university collaborations, you know, we've had quite a lot of success doing that. The, the, the money's there. But the, I mean, the important thing about the area that my school has a lot of work in, which is in, in terms of arts, is that there's a health outcome and there is a measurable outcome. Mm. You can measure whether somebody is recovering or not. There's a, you can calibrate that. This is, the, this is the pointy end that you're That's talking about. That's the pointy end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the more mm, diffuse end of, of, of arts and health, which I would call health in arts, you know, the capacity to demonstrate health through arts, which may be public displays, it may be all those sorts of things. That's a lot harder to measure. It's mm. a lot harder to measure. You know, we're talking about building community capacity, building community cohesion. Uh, that's, that, 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 that's more difficult. Yeah. And in public health, we know that. Are those measurements important? Well, they are, because you've got to show that you've kind of made a difference. Mm. In a sense, you've got to show that you've... You, you, you've made a difference. And, of course, you can show that difference by talking to the constituents. And sometimes what you expected to come out of the relationship emerges. Sometimes there's a lot of unexpected consequences which, you know, are, are mostly very beneficial. Mm. So that end of arts and health, I think, is, is probably, from, a, from the health point of view, is, is more difficult. So we don't have, at the moment, that end of arts and health in my school. We used to have it. We used to have a, a program which was around public health and arts, and, and Christine Putland, who's here today, used to lead that. So there was a whole suite of programs and short courses that were around that. Um, it goes to show you that when you lose the leadership, you lose the momentum. And so if, to make this important again, we need to get leadership in that area. OK, so you need leadership and you need to get the communication you do. happening. So you do. Do, you, do therefore we need, and you've already mentioned that you would take the role of being the head honcho, uh, the dean, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Medical science, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. need that kind of, what, what does that leadership need to look like beyond simply saying, yes, we will do that? Yeah. What is really required? OK, it needs advocacy, doesn't it? It needs advocacy right the way through. Uh, there needs to be spokespeople, there needs to be a backup. Yep. Because there's no point in going out as a dean saying this is really, really important then you look behind you and there's no one there, no one there to echo and support your voice. So you need to build capacity within the, within the organisation as well. Yep. So if I was going to build more capacity for arts and health in my school, I'd need the support of quite a few people in the school to say that's a good gig, we'll, we'll get behind you. And what we will do is we will talk to our professional associations about the importance of this, because when you're dealing with health, especially health care, you're dealing with practitioners who invariably belong to one or other of their professional associations. Mm. And they are very, very important because they're the ones that help strike what is considered to be appropriate standards of practice. And in a university, you're often speaking to that because you need to get your course accredited. And your course is accredited to the extent that your students are being prepared for appropriate best practice. Is all this making sense? So what you have to do is you have to persuade the, the organisations as well that this is really, really important stuff, that they need to get on board with it. Why? Because there's the good evidence to show that it works. There's other evidence to show that you, you can transfer it into practice. You know, that's where you have... To, so you've got, to, you've got to have a strategy. Like any invasion, you know... <laughs> You've got, to, you've, got, you, you, you've got to get you've got to get organised both within and, and without. Organi and without but know. also, interestingly enough, if you do it from the education level, it has long-term impact. Yeah, so students will take that into it their does. further careers. Yeah, yeah. And so I was thinking about this gig naturally. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> thank I, God for I, that. <laughs> sort of boning up on what kind of art is happening in my school, and you know we have those programs that I mentioned, 
Um, but there were other areas where I said to people, so in speech pathology, do you have it? Well, not as such, not formally. But, and this was really interesting, it, happens quite, it happened quite often, but what I do in my practice is, so this was somebody who is in voice production. She gets people to colour in their voice. Show me what your voice looks like. Let's, let's take a piece of paper and show me the colours that you think your voice is. Let's take a piece of paper and show me the colours that you'd like your voice. So using R as a kind of vehicle, mm. vehicle there. Another member of uh, my, 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 my school was telling me about a fabulous programme that is uh, happening in Onkaparinga um, to support women who are escaping from domestic violence. And often these people, these women, have to be sheltered in shelters, but sometimes have to be put up in motels and things like that, you know, um, hard. Um, and so what these people do is they actually go and deliver to people who don't have the means to cook much for themselves, yeah. gifts of food. It's called Food for Freedom. Mm. So they go and find them and they give them a beautiful, beautiful bouquet of food that's easy to prepare. Uh, you know, imagine a gift like that when you're feeling mm. absolutely shocking. Mm. So food for freedom. So that was somebody, I suppose what I'm saying is that while there might not be a formal process yeah. always, yeah. there are often elements of, of art practice in, in what people are doing in order for them to make their practice more creative and more engaging. Mm. Um, one of the things that interests me about you, which is fortunately one of, n not the only thing, um, is, is pleasure. What, you, you, you're fascinated by pleasure, and you've written a number of articles on this, mm. and, the, and the role that pleasure can actually play uh, from a public health perspective. So give me a bit of background on that. What, what is it that interests you so much about pleasure? And I know just sitting with me gives you great pleasure. Look, I'm, I'm, getting I get, visceral, I get that, Fenella, I get I'm that. getting a visceral experience. I get it, I, mean, I, get, it, I get it. Tell me. So, so I suppose when I reflected on my practice as a clinical dietitian, quite a lot of my work there was dealing with people's pleasure and food. Um, there is, it's, it's without doubt that a lot of food that gives us pleasure is, is not necessarily healthy. So as a dietitian, I had to um, tell people to stop drinking, you know, soft drinks and just drink more water. Right. You know, just, just drink more water, you know, get used to it. And then I thought more broadly about um, public health and realised that actually a lot of public health is about dealing with pleasure. Uh, has anybody here ever smoked? It's quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> Only a couple <laughs> not of people were very high. It's actually, it's actually quite nice, you know. It's quite, it's quite, I won't ask whether people have taken drugs, that's all for you. But a lot of what, a lot, a lot of what people are, a lot, of what, a lot of public health is about dealing with pleasure, mm. whether it's sex, whether it's drugs, um, whether it's food, whether it's tobacco, you know, it's about dealing with that. And public health never talks about pleasure. It never, ever, if you look at public health and pleasure as a field of research, you will not find anything there. And it probably comes from the puritanical Protestant roots of public health. <laughs> it really does, you know. It really, really does. I mean, the temperance movement. If you like it, don't like that's it. That's right, yeah. Just don't enjoy it. it. You know, the yeah. temperance movement yeah. was not really about temperance. It was about abstinence, you mm. know. It was supposed to be about, can you just temper your alcohol? No, just don't do it. Mm, mm, so, um, so a lot of public health is about dealing with, with, with pleasure, but doesn't recognise that, won't go anywhere near that, partly because... They're very, very scared that people are going to say, look, you know, stop being the nanny, just leave us alone, you know, can we just get on? So another, you know, stick to beat public health with. Uh, so I, I was very interested in that. So with a guy called Robin Bunsen, whose, whose area was the history of alcohol and public health, mm. we, 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 we got together and we, we did some, you know, we wrote a couple of papers. Um, and it was, it was just a lovely journey into pleasure. Um, that hadn't been mined, and uh, it still hasn't. And mm. I'm doing another piece of work with, with somebody. So, so my interest in pleasure is the way that public health doesn't even issue it. It mm. just ignores it completely. Yeah, it completely just, it just ignores says... it. It's fascinating for me. And what happens with the body, the physiological changes in the body when we do experience pleasure? I mean, I know about the release of dopamine and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so so yeah. what is it that, that happens? I'm leading to somewhere here. Yeah, you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll have to give you the, uh, the Reader's Digest version. Go for, for it. This <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, we have endorphins and things like that that are released, and we've got these various neural pathways that the last feel relaxed, the last feel satisfied. But I think it happens in really interesting ways. So last Saturday, I saw the state theatre production, Things I Know 
to be true. Has anybody seen that? You know, I sobbed through about two thirds of that. I, I, I sat there and just howled. Well, I didn't howl. I was just rocking with, with grief. I love that moment when you're watching theatre. Yeah, and theatre the, the hardly ever. You yeah. know, the last thing that did this for me was Brokeback Mountain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so this was. I'm getting really, it right now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's the lights. It's the, the lights. The, 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 evidently, when it won an award at Cannes, uh, somebody came and said to Ong Lee, that "You go in the women's, you go in the women's room, and there's like you know, twenty women there howling." He yeah. said, "You should go in the men's room." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should go in the men's room. It's just a lot of feelings. So, so I came out of things I know to be true, thinking. That was very satisfying. I'm not mm. sure whether it was pleasurable. I, I, I got a lot out of it. But, you know, it, it is, is grieving. And I could, you know, is, 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 was that pleasurable? I think it was, actually. It was very fulfilling because yeah. I felt I really connected with the production. The play was so well produced and the script was so poignant. Um, and a lot of the themes, you know, are things that we've kind of rehearsed. So you asked me what the, you know, the, what is the physiological? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's an experience of something that's satisfying, fulfilling, um, and meets a need. Mm. And that's to to get to, I suppose, an end, an end point here. The the benefit then of having successful art, yeah. broadly yeah. within health to facilitate pleasure yeah. can, only, can only be a fant fantastic thing. So how then, therefore, to transform or change the attitudes of health professionals yeah. to allow more of that, to, to, to allow pleasure that yeah. you say doesn't even exist in the health sector? Well, it doesn't. I don't think... I mean, anybody here from public health, I'll probably get strung up. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I don't know. Pleasure doesn't come into the therapies. I don't see that it is has is, is got a, a role there, apart from... You know, isn't it great, uh, Mrs. Cartwright, that you've, you know, um, uh, improved your health or something like, you know, let's get some pleasure out of that. Mm. The, other, the other, actually, there is another place for pleasure in public health, and that is the pleasure in saying no. Right. <laughs> no, You know, no. a kind of ascetic pleasure. I could have eaten that. I could have <laughs> caved into that. But I simply didn't. <laughs> Isn't that pleasing? Mm. Mm. Isn't I that, could have had that. You know, glass and of you know, I'm not. I'm not going to knock that because <laughs> I've done that. Mm. I didn't have to go for that run, but I did. Yeah. Now that's yeah. very smug, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did you go for a run this morning? No, but I did practice some yoga. Okay, yeah. uh, that's interesting because that's the, that's the other thing. Because um, I know you sort of touched on this already, which is the healthism yeah. aspect, um, which is a term that I hadn't really come across before. Um, but there is the opposite side of that too, which is I don't know what the word would be, artism. This yeah. this this desire to co-opt everything as art, yeah. which you, you were mentioning, think, is sometimes could be a problem. So maybe a I, cautionary I think, yeah, tale. I think it is. So this kind of yoga that I practice is called shadow yoga. And it is it, do you mean like shadows as in my shadow on the wall? Well, it actually, it's actually a corruption of uh, the guy who really originated it, okay? a guy called Shandor, who came from Adelaide. Okay. And, and incorporates a lot, of, a lot of Indian dance as you're moving through the postures. You know, it's, it has some Iyenga poses, so there's quite a bit of grunting right, great. and stretching. <laughs> but a, quite, a, quite a lot of it is, is it incorporates these movements. And it's, it's very beautiful to actually be part of a group that are doing this together. Now, if somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, that's art, I don't know whether I'll be... I said, no, it's yoga, you know. <laughs> this is about me um, having a moment to connect with uh, my body, some mindfulness. I'm not sure whether I'm... This comes back to artism, mm -hmm. you know. Is, it, is that art? I suppose in the eyes of an artist it is, because what we've done is to incorporate into that, or what's been incorporated into that, are these these various dance movements. But actually, as an overall practice, which is, you know, has a great deal of integrity, they've not just been bolted on, it, it, it all kind of leads somewhere. Mm. Um, I don't know, what do people think about artism? Is, am, am, I, am I barking up the wrong tree? No. Uh, well, we'll get this in the question. Perception, Say that again, there's a perce perception. Perhaps it's perception, as in an artist looks a certain way, yeah. a health practitioner looks another way. Yeah. What a together. So right. connections. Exactly. Okay, connections that's back great. To that. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. <laughs> okay, which does lead me to a question then. We've talked about how the health world, I've got so many great terms for the health world, I'm sorry about this, um, how, how they 
the benefits of welcoming art into into various fields. But there, therefore, what is what, how important then is it for artists or art practitioners to learn the language of the medical professionals yeah. in order to better understand what is required? So, you know, when we roam across health, this is a huge canvas, a bit like art. You know, we, 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 we're working in really big spaces here, aren't we? Mm. So I think if you're thinking about health care, so let's, let's badge that health care, you have to use the language of outcomes. What's the purpose of this? Where does it fit into, fit into the therapy? How is it going to be used for particular health outcomes? What, you know, I think that's the language that, that needs to be used. What is the purpose of this? Mm. Um, what is the efficacy? Where is the evidence? You know, that's the kind of thing you have to bring to the fore. It, it doesn't necessarily mean the door is going to be pulled open because um, one thing you have to realise is that practices change very slowly, if at all. <laughs> As I say, uh, evidence doesn't always mean that people change practices. In fact, um, people were astounded when the um, results of a survey showed that um, a lot of the guidelines that are, that are there for general practice, and I'm not knocking general practitioners, but a lot of the guidelines that are there for best practice in general were simply not being followed. I mean, people just did what they did yesterday because mm. it seemed to work, you know, although it necess wasn't necessarily based on, on best evidence. So you have to get used to that lingo. You've got to get used to the lingo of health outcomes, evidence-based. Um, that's what you need to do. Mm. But there's, a, there's another area that I think we could usefully mine, and that's in another space, and that is... We, look, we talk a lot about evidence-based practice. I think that there's room for practice-based evidence. What I mean by that is if you see things happening because of some art intervention, you see something happening there and the same thing's happening there and the same thing's happening there and there and there and there. That's telling you something. You might not have gone into that with a control group, <laughs> you know, in a stock standard way in which you would look for evidence. But if you are seeing things happening mm. and changing uh, uh, repeatedly, you can, I believe, and I'm working on this at the moment, start to say, well, what, that's given us a form of evidence. That is telling us that in certain contexts there are these, there are these changes. And I think that's a, a term, I think that idea can be used very, very usefully for people who are working in, in art space. Mm -hmm. Because you are practitioners, you are dealing with, with with examples, you are dealing with cases, you are dealing with, you know, communities. And if you, if you are seeing similar things developing, you know, that's a form of evidence for me. Mm. That's a form of evidence. And, 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 possibly my, and what we're doing at the moment is asking whether we're brave enough to use that form of evidence to put it into policy. Are we? We're hoping to undertake a piece of research that, okay. that explores that. Are we brave enough to say, yes, it happened there, 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 there. And I think that there's room for policy here because, uh, th you know, there, there seems to be an overall efficacy yeah. in what's happening. Um, we're going to go to questions in a moment, um, but one of the things that really interested me when I was talking to you the other day was that you, you, you were saying that in Australia, and I think that we can talk about funding if we wanted to, but perhaps even beyond this, but in Australia that the role that art plays in our lives has been ripped away from us. We've ripped, away, yeah. ripped it away from ourselves. And in turn, that health has also been uh, dra dramatically transformed. Yeah. Can yeah. you explain that? So I heard this on the ABC, so it must be true. <laughs> um, that ours is one of the few cultures. I thought where I read it actually... on Wikipedia. That's definitely true. <laughs> ours is one of the few cultures where we've actually lifted art from everyday practice and we've turned it into a specialisation. So art is now a specialised practice. It's not necessarily embedded in in, in everyday life, um, which kind of reminded me of. And I was thinking, yeah, that's really interesting. When I did when I worked in New Guinea, I worked in New Guinea for for two years, and you know, there's no such thing there as the artist. <laughs> You know, there are some people who carve, uh, and there are some people who do, you know, work with um, with braid and things. But everybody does art. I mean, art is part of what you do each day when you go to the garden. You know, you take things with you. You take things to help uh, the spirits mm. look favourably on what you know. You, art is is part of what people do, even in their dress. You know, you'll see people with. Um, with, with you know very little to wear, but somehow they've woven into it certain forms of certain forms of art. And what we're trying to do now, I think, is to re-embed art back into everyday life. 
I'll, I'll find that. This, this is what we're doing today. We're trying mm. to bring. But the same thing is true for health. Mm. Um, we've lifted health out of everydayness. Uh, there was a time when just being, you know, the quotidian, the everydayness was was always harking to to health. We know that because when we meet, we say, "How are you?" That's not, not how many daffodils did you grow today. It's <laughs> how is your health? Yeah. You know, uh, hello. I think. Uh, etymological root comes back to some statement about health. So when we're interacting with each other, we're constantly rehearsing, how are you, how do you feel? Uh, which I think is probably a remnant of when health was part of everyday life. It was, it was probably because you had to pay attention to that because the conditions were so precarious. But what we've done, we've lifted that from everyday life and we've created specialists. And what we're trying to do in health is to re-embed that in everyday life. You know, we're saying, you know, when you, we're saying when you choose food, you know, generally choose, choose healthy food. When you try to build physical activity, I'm using public health sort of examples here, but we're trying to embed health practice back into, into, everyday, into everyday life. Mm. And I think that's a problem we're running into. Mm. You know, we're special, we've, we've created these specialisations, which in other cultures, and in our, even in our own culture, um, were, were, were not necessarily, se necessarily separate. We're trying, we're trying to re-embed them back into everyday life. I've, and we've, we're running into problems there mm. because everyday life is resisting that in many ways, mm. you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Don't need to. Yeah. So how then, how, sh how can we embed this back into our lives? I mean, I, I think in some ways that we are doing this and there are great benefits to it, of course, and part of it is, is about how we live in yeah. our world. We are busy, we go to work, we have to grab fast food, we have to, you know, we don't have time to sit down and, you know, write or something like that like we're used to. We use our yeah. iPhones. We're not thinking yeah. as much as we used to. Yeah. So times have changed. That's sure, but there's this whole return to, you know, the doer, you know, the doer maker economy, the DIY, you know, whether it's people on Etsy or something like that, the sharing economy. There's a whole bunch of different avenues here mm. where people are trying to find their way back, mm. and I think that they are doing it, mm. but in a very new way. Mm. So the arts is, is returning, but it's it's not the same well, as it was. Well, I think the talent here today is is really all about that. It's about making those connections, isn't it? It's about how do we how do we bring art sometimes off a pedestal mm. and 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 hand it back to people in a way that uh, is accessible, um, affordable. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I think that's part of what we're doing here. How do we make those connections? Mm. And so that, but it's a bit of an uphill battle then for artists to try and make those connections, or is that a bit of a, a macabre view of it, really? I, I, I don't know. I, I think that there's a, a, a public out there that um, is really willing to engage in what we're calling art, which is creative practice in all sorts of ways. Mm. And if we're talking about health, then that's the vehicle that we are, that we're using. Um, I'm not sure if yeah. I've answered that very it, well. It's funny, I, know, I want to go to your questions in a second, but one of the things you talked about before was, was how important it was for artists or those who are working in arts and health to, to find outcomes, so to have yeah. qualitative outcomes to yeah. show that to the, to the medical community, for example. But, I, but one of the great beautiful things about art is having free reign. Yeah. Is, is being able to simply create mm. for the sake of creating. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So yeah. where, where does free reign and outcomes play? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose you have to ask the question, is this art in the purpose of mm. some other kind of some other kind of outcome, whether it's improved mental health, improved mobility, improved learning about health, or whether it's just appreciation and the pleasure you get from celebrating the creative, I'm going to cry, the creativity of humans. I mean, <laughs> you know, is that what it is? And, some, and, and that's what I saw last yeah. Saturday. That's what I saw. That was what was so moving and so fulfilling. You know, I didn't think that health had anything to do with that. It was just the most wonderful, wonderful, sad experience. <laughs> but, but fabulous. And, you know, you don't have to pay a ticket to uh, a, a theatre to get that. You can see that in other forms of art that people hear that people here create. Mm. I was fortunate enough to be in Alice Springs late last year and uh, went through some of the, the galleries there. And you know, I get dot painting, I, I get that as a symbol of, you know, that's our community sitting down. If you see them like this, they're sitting in a group. But there were a couple of um, pieces um, that were just fabulous. One was just these great big um, rings that were coloured ochre and various forms of, of, of yellow um, trailing off somewhere and, and 
and I thought, well, this is probably somebody's story. But it's not a story that, I'm, that I've heard about, you know, with the dot painting. Mm. Where is somebody's imagination to do that? There, you know, there are no humans in this. No one said, oh, that's their head and that's their feet. This just came from someone's mind. And mm. it was wonderful. It was absolutely... And I, I, I did think, where... That's amazing that somebody could actually imagine that mm, mm. and then paint it. That moment you know? of wonder. I, 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 I so get beautiful. kind of figurative stuff. I yeah. get that, but this was just beyond that. This was this was not people. This, you know, and, and I suppose in a sense, then to be brave enough to say, "That's going up there," mm, you know, mm. "That's going up there." And I thought that was terrific. Okay, uh, John. It's good to and talk it, with you. Yeah. We'll continue on. If you have a question for John, I think there's microphones going around, and I shall point to you politely. Thank you, sir, at the back. Oh, here we go. Can, I don't know whether they can hear you. We've got people in the one and nines, you see. Hello. Check. There, there we, we go. go. Thank you. Just say thank you very much for thank Gastronaut. I think it's one of the best programs on radio. Um, thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> nice, nice, nice to see you. Are you a co-host? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm sorry. Nice to voice. Uh, uh, as a designer, I'm really interested in whether there's one space that's really inspired you in terms of both arts and health. Well, this is going to be um, a space that, that many of you know. And it's that space where uh, Michelangelo's David <laughs> stands. Uh, is it in the Uffizi? It's in one of those places in Florence. And it's like down the end of a corridor. And you, 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 you come and you, you think, now where do I go? And you look and you see this thing down there. Um, and then you, you walk towards it and it just gets more and more beautiful and staggeringly beautiful. And I think very, very uplifting. So I'm sorry, that's a very conventional and probably cheap way of cashing in that, that answer. But for me, you know, that, that's a space I'll, I'll, I'll always remember uh, because it was just so moving. Um, and I say, the closer you get, the better you look uh, when it comes to something like that. It was yeah. just, it's just phenomenal. So as a celebration of that, um, yeah. yeah. Can I just say, I had to have an operation on my arm last year, and when my doctor's ch uh, rooms, operating rooms, changed from one room to another because they were fixing up the other ones, so I went to this old building, and all of a sudden, from a dark white lab kind of space, and it was this old building, it was heaps of sunlight, and I just went, this is the best place to be. It was somewhere that was big, open, lots of sunlight. So yeah. From a design point of view, it was about me as a person feeling very comfortable in a medical environment. So there's my one. I understand that the, the NRA, the new RA, um, has been designed so that every room is able to receive natural light. Every room. Even where the surgeons are working? I, look, yeah. it may be that as well. That's yeah, cool. It may be that as well. <laughs> and that's why it's so long, because they've had to create these inner courtyards in order to let the light, the light in. And I asked the people who are kind of showing you around, I said, what's the standout feature of the, of the new RA? If you had to boast about it, what would it be? And I thought they were going to talk about the robots who are going to be taking food from one place to another. They said, the ability for every room to have natural light and, yep. the, healing, and the healing properties of that. Mm, mm. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? You know, yep. to have these pointy heads talking in that language. Yep. That yep. is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that is amazing. It's true. Thank you. Uh, just here at the front. Thank you, Tracy. A bit faster, Tracy. Thank you. Um, I'm John Oliver from Flinders University. One of the things that you touched on, Fenella, I, I think you kept trying to draw out of John, um, the problem of funding is the big issue. Um, and we heard about, and you kept pressing about physicians. And, you know, they're organic. Uh, they, they, they make a lot of money. So how can you tap into that? As I've always been looking for an avenue into that. But, you know, um, Big pharmacy companies too, um, they, they sell drugs that don't work, but they sell them at a great profit. But we, it is about the evidence and how do you get that. And as a, as a cohort, as a, as a group interested in art and what it does uh, for the benefit of patients, chasing down that evidence to give to these people who are you know, very hard to uh, convince, they'll take everything that you can throw at them they give 
nothing back in reality. Um, so how do you do that? So as a collective, I would have been thinking, you know, I, th I think somebody's here from the ARC or got somebody a grant. That's where it has to be focused. It has mm -hmm. to come in at that sort of level. And um, it has to be seen to be uh, better than complementary and alternative medicines, if you like, which most of them do not work. Uh, mm -hmm. But you've just talked about sunlight, and it does work. Mm -hmm. So how do you get the money? That's the issue. Um, we're all converts here, but how do you actually access money that will allow um, uh, the arts to flourish and yeah. provide um, benefit to the community and patients? That's the issue. Mm. Okay, so how do you how do you access money? Which is a big question. Who who would like to know the magic answer to that one? <laughs> magic. Great. Tax deductible. You're welcome to pass a little bit more on to me yeah. on the side. That'd be great. No. What do, what do you think, John? What's, what's missing? Well, I, I th money is a great motivator. Yeah. A great, great motivator. And um, having some kind of stream of funding that was put forward for, for research, practice, from one of our national benefactors. I'm not talking about the private sector, although I wouldn't say no to them, depending on the money, depending on the sort. You know, that, that's where I think mm. it could certainly happen. And even within the conventional funding streams, there are these university industry partnerships that uh, are available um, that uh, are probably underexploited in this area and I'm thinking health arts you know mm. but it's also getting back I think to what you're saying before we've, we've taken away art from our everyday life yeah. health has done the same thing to yeah. bring it back in again to yeah. bring those connections to get that conversation happening maybe the funding eventually if we do achieve that will come back through there's always a role for philanthropists though yeah I well don't, there always I don't has think Australia been, has enough of you know artists have always had philanthropists haven't yeah, they They've always yeah. been sponsored by mm. somebody who's you know got money to sponsor yeah there, there is cash out there amongst people I don't know about South Australia it's probably but there's, you know there's, there's probably more. a workshop somewhere that yeah. needs to look at that how do you you know how, let's pull our talent and work out where you get the money from yeah who's been successful who here has been successful in getting grants for mm. arts and health projects? Okay, well, here we go. Okay, who's been successful with crowdfunding campaigns for arts and health projects? Somebody at the back? One. Oh, no. Um, I wanted to suggest the possibility of a Medibank funding art therapists because um, art therapy is something that anybody can do. You don't need any artistic skills at all. It's symbolic. And we're here in Reconciliation Week. Um, the indigenous culture that we have all around us uh, use symbolic art to tell a story, to express themselves, and we have a great deal to learn from them as well. So, Medibank is a possibility, and um, again, that's um, privately funded as opposed to publicly mm. funded. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question? Oh, just here at the front. Thank you, and then one behind in the red jacket. Hi, I'm Olivia, and I'm a regional artist from Wyala. Um, and I was just wondering about your research, if you've looked at like reprogramming or reassociating pleasure. So say from something that's not so great to something better, so a good thing becomes a pleasurable thing instead of something bad with nutrition, maybe? Very interesting, because one of the areas that I'm looking at with some people in Europe is whether we can find moments in the day when we think about food and think, and that, and that helps enhance our well-being. And this is coming from a project, a very small project, where we, we did something called experience sampling of um, women who were working and had the major responsibility for family food provision. That's a really big gig. <laughs> so these are... And so what we did, we experience sampled them. So experience sampling is when you randomly send them a text saying, what are you doing now? How do you feel? Um, and I think this was, the next question was, is it food related? And we found generally when people, when these women were thinking about food, they usually felt pretty awful because they were thinking, I've got to get food on the table or, mm -hmm. you know, Julie's got to go to ballet and things like that. So we're trying to find moments in the day when you actually think about food and you actually feel very pleasured by that. And, I th and just looking at some of the early work, the very, very early work, often that's about eating with other people. Mm. It involves conviviality, or what is called commensality, sharing, sharing the table. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be eating with so-and-so tonight. I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm, I'm, I don't know if that's answering your question, just taking things a step further. But certainly in, um, 
in the area of food and gastronomy, the whole issue of conviviality and this notion of commensality, which other cultures have in spades, um, is really gaining a lot of attention, mm. a lot of attention. I'm hoping to bring to Adelaide next year um, a, a guy called Claude Fischler from, from France who has done a lot of work in this area. Um, yeah, so watch this space. Okay. I think we can do that, yeah. Thank you, just, uh, yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Anthony from Country Arts, and uh, John, uh, great talk. And you started the talk by saying you were referred to as an arts lover in the brochure, but you didn't feel like you were one. And throughout your entire talk, you've been talking about your appreciation of art. Yeah. And I think part of the problem we have in the arts industry, or you know, in the arts, is that people don't actually associate themselves with being an appreciator of art. Yeah. And yet, in their everyday lives, in the in the, in the way they choose to, to dress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're constantly an appreciator of art. Uh, and yes, you can go to the theatre, and I saw the State Theatre Company, I totally agree with your comments, so there's a few days left, I think, in the season, so I yeah. can get there. Yeah. But, um, you know, so, so this, is, this is partly what we battle in the arts, and, and I wonder whether that's even uh, more high, uh, heightened in the, in, in the health industry as well. I, I think it probably is. I think there's a lot of preconceptions about what art means. You know, it's painting, or it's performance, um, and mm. usually done by professionals. <laughs> Um, that's what I mean when I say I think what we've done in our culture is that we've lifted art from the everyday and we've given it to specialisations. And we appreciate that, of course. That's, that's, you know, we really do appreciate that because it helps us celebrate what it is to be absolutely fantastic at that. But then the expectation is that, well, if I can't do that, I'm not art. If I, if I can't perform like that, that's not, really, that's not really art. It's something else. And I, th I do think that's a problem that... There are these preconceptions, certainly in health, about what art might mean. Um, and part of the, I think, part of the journey that we have to have together is to bring that down to what I call the quotidian, you know, the everydayness of, of art. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Hi. It was a really enjoyable talk. It was great. It just sort of opens everything up. You were talking about Belinda laying in a podcast, yeah. if we wanted that. I just wondered how we would get that from you. What I'm going to do <laughs> is, uh, it's, it's, it's a podcast, and it's on um, my school's website, but what I'll do is uh, I'll make sure that um, it's given to you and you can, you can hear me, uh, hear Belinda talking to me about her work. It's really great work. Graphic Excellent. Work. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll fit one more question in just here on the, in the aisle. Tracy, if you wouldn't mind speeding it up. Just, just thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yay, that's the way. Very good. <laughs> Isn't Tracy great? Yeah, yeah. Hello, my name's Tanya. I'm an artist from Little Hampton. Um, my question is about the difference, I guess, between how art perceives and how health perceives. And what I'm wondering is how important to you is basically, as an artist, we pay attention, we notice, we we try to work something out and we're always trying to get more awareness about why we're doing what we're doing, which is pure psychology in a way. So how then do you get the health side of things to be encouraging their patients to do that and therefore they can heal their own psychology? Mm. So your question is, you feel that you're putting yourself into a health space Not through your creativity? Yes, of art making. Yeah. Um, makes you look at why am I doing this, how am I doing it, what's yeah. working, what's not yeah. working, and you yeah. do that naturally through that process. Yeah. <clears throat> so how can health bring, I guess, it into okay. the awareness of their okay. patients? So, so remember that when a therapist yeah. is also working, they are doing what you're doing for art. They're saying, what I'm doing here is I'm following this particular procedure, um, I know that it's beneficial, I know that it works, I believe it has some kind of course, the end of which will be the improvement of this person's health outcome. Um, that might not have any art in it whatsoever, but remember that that's what's justifying that person's practice. What, we've, what I think is necessary is for um, a relationship between art and health to say, and if you added this, then you would enhance that particular experience from the patient's point of view, but actually also from your point of view, because I think art is so fabulously creative and inventive mm. that as a practitioner, you would get benefit from, from that as well. So that's the conversation we have to have. How do you build 
art endeavours into health practice to demonstrate that actually there's an enhancement here that is synergistic, mm. you know? It's, it's more than the sum of the parts because that's what human creativity is. Yeah. What a w way to finish it, I've got to say. Um, before we do that, do you want to sing? <laughs> Just let you know. Uh, they don't want me to sing. <laughs> no. You don't want me to sing, do you? <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Just... <laughs> Jess, okay. I just think it's a good way to wrap up. It's kind of it's a wonderful way to wrap up, and thank you for a fantastic final question. Okay. I've got to say, so uh, we'll all do up. Well, yeah, okay. So yeah. this is the line. You've got to do up, okay? Yeah, and I'll, I'll um, just. And then when I do this, you'll stop because there's a bridge, and then I'll bring you back in. And, and Tracy, okay. what are you doing during this? <laughs> just keep keep yep. a watch on the aisles, okay? Make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Shall we give it a go? Okay. So the line is <laughs> do wa ba do up, do wa ba do up. Do a ba do a, do a ba do a, blue moon. Do a ba do a, do You saw me standing alone, do a do a, without a dream in my heart, do a ba do a, without a love of my own, do a ba do a, do a ba do a, blue moon. You knew just what I was there for. You heard me sing a prayer for the one I really could care for. Yay! And then <laughs> uh, what an incredible... You, know, you see yeah, what that says? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm never going to sing again. <laughs> um, never. I, that is never going to happen. I think you've got a beautiful voice and you've brought us all together in a really gorgeous opening conversation here at, at this conference today. So you're an incredibly good sport. Thank Professor you. John Coveney, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you. I have to ask the Thank you. Hostess. Let's do one more round of applause for Fenella yeah. and John. <laughs> Uh, you've actually run over time, so get off the stage, yeah. please. <laughs> Four minutes to be precise.